Formula One cars can come to a stop from 100 kilometers an hour in about 15 meters, which is almost a quarter of the braking distance of your average road car. They can go from 300 kilometers an hour to a complete stop in under four seconds, pulling up to 6G of deceleration force. With such high speeds and tough corners, F1 cars need to be able to produce massive braking forces, not just for performance, but for safety as well. A driver needs to know the car will respond when they press the brake pedal and not cream it into a wall or the back of a competitor. Let's look at the braking system of an F1 car as a whole before we dive into the individual components. When the driver hits the brake pedal, it transmits a force to two master cylinders. One cylinder controls rear braking and the other front braking. Let's focus on the front braking to start with as it's much simpler. The master cylinder acts on brake calipers, which squeeze brake pads onto brake discs. This hard friction between the brake pads and the discs slows the car down. Now let's take a closer look at those components then. These master cylinders are filled with brake fluid, just a couple of hundred milliliters worth. The fluid fills the brake lines that runs from these cylinders to the brake calipers, acting as the arteries of the braking system. Now fluid is incompressible, so when the pedal is pressed and the plunger is pushed into the cylinder, the fluid immediately put forces on the other end of the brake line. This is how hydraulic systems work. The brake calipers are like clamshells around the brake discs and house brake pads within each side of the shell. The hydraulics feed into pistons, no more than six, within the calipers and these pistons push the brake pads into the brake discs. As the brake discs are attached to and spin with the wheels, when the pads clamp onto the wheels the frictional force between them will slow the spinning of the wheel and ultimately the speed of the car. The calipers themselves are often mounted low on the discs to keep centre of mass low, but tend to be placed closer to the 5 or 7 o'clock position rather than the lowest 6 o'clock position. This is partly because the bleed nipple needs to be fairly high. A bleed nipple, you ask, with horror in your eyes? Well, remember when I said fluid was incompressible and that was what allowed pedal force to instantly translate to the brakes? Well, sometimes air bubbles can get into the hydraulics and gas is compressible. So when the brake pedal is pushed with gas in the system, the gas can deform, reducing the braking force at the other end. To flush this gas out, you can open the nipple and as it's placed high up, the gas will rise more readily to the top and be flushed out when you force fluid into the system. You'll often bleed the system between sessions just to be on the safe side. Onto the actual brake pad and discs then. The brake disc can be no larger than 278 millimeters in diameter or 32 millimeters thick. A larger diameter means greater stopping power as it's easier to stop a spinning disc by grabbing it further from the pivot point than closer to the centre. The restriction of the rules in this area is to limit braking power of the car so braking zones can remain somewhat competitive. Unlike steel type brakes on modern road cars, F1 brakes are made of a special carbon composite called, hilariously, carbon carbon. It's called this because it's two types of carbon composited together, uh, a carbon lattice like graphite that's reinforced with carbon fibre. Carbon carbon is strong and can withstand very high temperatures and has a very high coefficient of friction. Now the coefficient of friction of a material just tells you how well a material grips when rubbing against another material. Ice being slidey has low coefficient of friction. Rubber being not slidey at all has a high coefficient of friction. Carbon carbon also has very low thermal expansion and low thermal shock, meaning it won't deform or crack suddenly under high temperatures. This ability to stay robust under high temperatures is extremely important. See, the way brakes slow tyres down is by converting energy. The kinetic or moving energy of the spinning wheels is converted by the brakes into heat energy. As the brake pads grip the disc, the high frictional forces turns the energy of the wheel into tremendous amounts of heat. A cold brake can heat up by as much as 100 degrees every tenth of a second in the initial phase of braking. Carbon brakes work optimally between 400 and 800 degrees Celsius, though heavy braking can often push brakes to 1000 or 1200 degrees Celsius. Now brakes being overly hot causes two real problems. One, if the brake is already hot then it has less ability to absorb heat and therefore take energy from the wheels. If under braking the brake disc can rise from 300 to 1000 degrees, it's acting as much more of an energy pump than if it could only move from 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius. Two, the main driver of brake wear is thermal degradation, which is wear due to temperature. At high temperature the carbon will readily oxidise, which is essentially burning at the surface layers. In excessive wear or prolonged overheating, the carbon deeper within the brakes can oxidise and weaken the structural integrity of the brakes, which is why worn out brakes start to disintegrate to dust. In worst cases, the brakes can simply explode. So the temperatures of the brakes need to be carefully managed if they're going to last a race distance. And as fluid cooling is banned, the engineers use good old fashioned air cooling to solve this problem. Now the premise of air cooling is very simple and exactly the same as using a fan to cool yourself off on a hot day. By using a stream of fast flowing air, 
heat will transfer from a hot surface to the air molecules passing by, which will carry this heat away from the hot body. As a car moves quickly through the air, the brake ducts channel some of the cooler airstream into the brakes to do this job. To further improve air cooling, the brake discs themselves are ventilated. Narrow channels run through the brake disc from the centre to its circumference. As the brake disc spins, cool air is forced from the centre out through the brakes and away from the system, carrying brake heat away downstream. Over the years, these channels have reduced in size but increased in number, providing greater overall volume for channelling air. Now, larger brake ducts can be more of an aerodynamic drag, but the difference in top speeds between using larger brake ducts and smaller versions are only a couple of kilometres an hour. A greater reason for adjusting the size of the brake ducts is more to do with the braking nature of the circuit. If you're having to brake frequently and or heavily, the brakes will need more intensive cooling as you aren't coming off the brakes as often and giving them enough time to lose their temperature. You don't want to keep heading into braking zones with the brakes at 800 degrees. So large brake ducts will more intensively cool the brakes in the periods between the braking zones. On the other hand, the brakes don't actually work very well when they're very cold. You ideally want them at at least 400 degrees when you hit the brakes. If you're not braking very often on a circuit, so there are long periods of time between braking zones for the brake temps to come back down, you'll probably opt for smaller brake ducts so they don't lose too much temperature. When you hit the brakes at cold temperatures, the brakes can take a few hundredths or even tenths of a second to kick in properly, which isn't ideal. The other interesting problem to manage is that of feeding the thermal degradation problem. As I said, at high temperatures the carbon oxidises. This means the carbon atoms bond with oxygen atoms in the air, forming carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. Now, the brakes take a while to cool down, and all the time they're at this high temperature they're still ripe for oxidation. And all this while the brake ducts are feeding the carbon more and more air, which includes oxygen, and this can accelerate the problem. Tricky. You'll often see engineers blanking off brake ducts with, aptly, duct tape, if the ducts seem to be feeding too much air into the brakes, either temperature or degradation-wise. So that's the simple end of the braking system. The front brakes are powered by a simple, straightforward hydraulic system. The rear end is more complicated. Since the hybrid power unit was introduced, the MGUK is a significant part of the system that slows down the rear wheels. This duty is now shared between the brakes and the MGUK. To manage this effectively, the rear brakes are not operated by a simple hydraulic system, but by brake-by-wire. A brake-by-wire system, sometimes obliviously referred to as BBW, means the physical action of the brake pedal is not directly attached to the physical action of the brake calipers. Instead, there's a computer in between telling the brakes what to do. The MGUK can take up to 2 megajoules of energy from the rear wheels per lap. How much energy the MGUK harvests under braking at any given time is decided by things like brake pedal pressure, harvesting settings and battery level. The rest of the deceleration is performed by the actual brakes. Now the electronic control unit or ECU is fed live information constantly, calculating and delivering exactly how much work the physical brakes and the MGUK perform in decelerating the car when the brake pedal is pushed. Any excess hydraulic pressure not used to brake the car is automatically fed back into the system via a release valve. And this all happens on the fly and it's incredibly sophisticated and while all this is going on it has to feel like real braking to the driver. Now because the rear brakes don't have to do as much work as they are sharing the load with the MGUK, the brake discs themselves are a lot smaller than they previously were. But if there's a failure of the MGUK and brake by wire system, the rear brakes will have to do all the work, and this is suddenly a massive problem. Larger discs can manage and dissipate heat much more effectively than small discs, which overheat very quickly. This happened to Ricardo in Monaco after his MGUK failure, so he had to move the brake bias forwards to take the load off the rear brakes. Brake bias, or brake balance, sets how the braking force is shared between the front and rear brakes when the pedal is pushed. Ideally, you want each brake doing the exact amount of work necessary for the weight load it's managing. Now at rest, an F1's car weight is distributed roughly 45-55, i.e. 55% of the weight is supported by the rear tyres. But under heavy braking, the weight shifts forward to as much as 55-45, so you'll tend to end up setting a brake bias to about 55% frontwards. Too much front brake bias, and the fronts will grip too tightly and lock the wheels, causing heavy understeer. Too much rear bias, and the back wheels can lock and cause the car to become unstable and maybe spin. Ideally, you want all your brakes to deliver their maximum force, and if you push slightly too hard, all the wheels should lock in unison. But erring on the side of front bias is wise, as a lock-up of the front at least keeps the car stable, not throwing it into a spin. 
Drivers can adjust brake bias between corners from within their cockpit, but this is only allowed while the car is off the brakes. F1 brakes are a complicated technology with the potential for phenomenal stopping power. With such state-of-the-art materials and design, half the battle continues to be managing brake temperatures and bias throughout each session, to keep degradation at bay and to try and ensure the brakes are in the perfect temperature range for every braking zone. 